Hello lovely people, welcome to the Geek Cover, I am Penge, and welcome to Crusader Kings 3, which is the latest big grand strategy game by Paradox, where we get to travel back in time by around about a thousand years, give or take, and see if we can create ourselves a dynasty that will continue to reign throughout the ages. So there is war and growth and politics and intrigue and decision making and plotting and science and so much more stuff besides. It's very, very detailed, is Crusader Kings 3. There is an awful lot going on. It's really, really wonderful, and it creates some great tales. It allows you to tell a very good story through your actions and the actions of your dynasty as well, all the people in your dynasty, or your family and your courtiers and your knights and all that kind of stuff. They can all become part of the story, and the world around you is constantly changing as well through wars and changes in leadership and changes in religion and culture and all that kind of stuff. So there is so much stuff going on that helps the game tell these fantastic stories, and I like that. I like the fact that we're not surging towards some end goal immediately. We're just going with the flow. We're going with the flow. We're seeing where the story of the game takes us. And I think that sounds very good indeed. Now this is available now on Steam. So of course, if you're interested, there is a link to the Steam store page in the video description below. So you can go and check it out and all that kind of stuff. And we were given a key to this by Paradox themselves, which is very, very kind. So thank you very much, Paradox people. That is very, very splendid of you indeed. So without any further ado, let's go and create ourselves a new dynasty and play some Crusader Kings 3. Okay, so the first thing we've got to do is pick what year we would like to start in. And we can choose to start either in the year 867 or the year 1066. And of course, they're quite different. Those two worlds are quite different because that's almost 200 years difference between them. So there'll be different realms and kingdoms and characters and religions and cultures and all sorts of stuff. So, you know, they're not going to be the same kind of game. It's going to be two sort of different experiences playing in 867 or 1066. And then the game gives us these things across the top, which they're not exactly scenarios. They're kind of just flavors if you like flavors of the game because i don't think when you play these that there is an end goal it's not like you play this and it goes hooray you have won crusader kings it just gives you a little bit of sort of history as to how these characters are all linked together and what was going on at this particular point in time so yeah, you can go and play these characters and you can see the over here let's go to wrath of the northmen if you choose to play as duke of the isles ivar the boneless you will have an easier experience. Whereas if you play as Earl Alfred, the Count of Dorset, you will have a slightly harder time of things. So, you know, you don't have to do what this story says up here. You don't have to repeat history. You can do whatever you like. But yeah, you're going to have a harder time down here with Earl Alfred than you are with Mr. Boneless over there, which is a good name. Although I don't know how he moves about. But uh, yeah, what we'll do is we will go over here and we will play as any ruler in 1066 because you don't have to play as the ones that the game gives you here no no you can play as anybody you like on the entirety of the world map so we will be doing that and we will be starting in the year 1066 and here is the world map of Crusader King 3, and it's really pretty. When you zoomed all the way out, it's got this nice sort of hand-drawn kind of appearance to it. It looks like a bit of kind of parchment that's torn off and put on a table. And it's even got things like down here, sort of here be monsters kind of drawings. So there's a weird sea monster there, and there's a serpent, and there's a crack, and all that kind of stuff. And of course, it's got all the different colours as well, representing all of the different realms and kingdoms and all that kind of stuff. So it looks really pretty. Also, it is massive. It is a huge, huge world. I mean, if we just go to, say, France, let's just zoom in over France. So you can see this is the lovely kingdom of France here in all of its blue glory. But if we zoom in a little bit, France breaks down into all of these different areas here. And then those areas break down further into smaller sort of subregions. So yeah, you can see Berry here is part of France, but then you're going a bit closer and Berry is broken up into here, into all these little sort of smaller bits. And then there's like a sort of a castle there and a church there and a town here. And they all have their own different things. They've got their own bishops and they generate their own tax and generate certain amounts of sort of uh, warriors and stuff like that. So there is an awful lot going on. There's so much going on on this map. I'm amazed at all the numbers that the game must be crunching as it sort of goes on. But we're going over here. We're going to play our game over here in England in 1066. So if we click on the Kingdom of England, it tells us that we can play, if we want to, as King Harold II. But I don't think we want to play as King Harold. I mean, I'm sure he's lovely. He's got a nice cloak on. He's got a fabulous moustache. He's got a very exciting crown. I mean, that is very good indeed. But he also has a lot of history to him. He's the king and he's 44 years old. So he's got a lot of story already. And what I like about this game, what I see as one of the big draws to this game, is that you can create your own dynasty and have your own stories and your own tales 
skills and everything can be started out a bit new. Whereas Harold here, we'd just be continuing his story. We'd just be continuing Harold's story. Whereas I want to start from scratch with somebody. I want to start from scratch, a nice sort of open book where we can make our own history and tell our own story. So Harold, I'm very sorry, but we're not going to be you because you're going to have loads of stuff as well. I mean, you're going to have loads of family because you're 44 and you're the king. And because you're the king, you're going to have loads of gold and loads of armies and loads of vassals at your bidding and all that kind of stuff. So no, we will not be playing as you, Harold. However, there is a perfect person that we are going to play as. And it was wonderful when I found this out because when I was looking through, I was thinking, OK, who are we going to play as? What character is going to be good for our first Crusader Kings run of the channel? And then I stumbled across someone who is absolutely perfect. So, in the middle of England is the county of Northamptonshire, just here. Now, at the moment, in 1066, Northamptonshire, it's not that important in the grand scheme of things. There are more influential counties around England. I mean, it's got towns and it's got churches and people are living there and they're happily living their best Northamptonshire lives. But, you know, it's not that important in the grand scheme of things in England. There are far more important places going on right now in this particular year. However... We're going to try and change that a little bit. We're going to try and put Northamptonshire back on the map a tiny bit because we are going to be playing as Earl Waltheof Stewardson of Northamptonshire, who is only 16 years old. Now, this is brilliant for us because he's only 16, which means that he is relatively young, which means he is unlikely to have too much backstory going on. So we probably have a relatively clean slate with him. I mean, he's got no player heir, so he's got no heir. He's only 16. I don't even know if he's married. I would imagine not. And, you know, he's probably quite new at this. I imagine he's just come of age. He's turned 16 and the people who've been looking after him all this time have gone, right, you're 16, get out the door and run a county. We're off. Bye bye. So, you know, he's probably quite new to this. So we will get to shape him and shape the destiny of him and shape all the sort of the, his house and his dynasty and all that kind of stuff. It'll be very, very exciting. And also what is exciting is I live in Northampton, which is wonderful. So I live over here. So, you know, I'm sort of uh, looking after and managing my home county, which is splendid. So I do like that as well. Also, another good thing is that Northamptonshire just looks after itself. It's got this sort of bit here and a bit over here. That's it. We kind of look after these bits here. So we're not part of a larger kind of body, if you like. We're not part of a larger duchy. So over here, say, this chap here, Duke Edwin Elfgarson of Mercia, looks after quite a lot of places. He looks after an awful lot of places, and then he has kind of vassals to help him manage some of those places. Whereas we just look after this just here. We look after Northamptonshire, and that is wonderful. I do like that. And a little bit over here. We look after a little bit over that side as well, which is very, very good indeed. So I believe we do report in directly to the liege. It says there that our liege is the king. So we report in directly to King Harold with his amazing crown. So as we touched upon, Northampton not particularly important in the grand scheme of things right now. Just over 100 years prior to this in the game, it was attacked by the Danish and the people of Northamptonshire did resist. Hurrah, go people of Northamptonshire. And then the Danes popped by again in the year 1010 to do a little bit more pillaging and they set it on fire, which, you know, is kind of what they do because they're Vikings and all that kind of stuff. And then in 1065, some of the northern earls also came down here and set bits of Northampton on fire, which is a little bit uncalled for because the Northern Isles, I assume, are kind of on our side, really. You know, they're sort of, you know, they're from our land, so they should be a bit friendly. So we might have to go back and get revenge on them at some point. That could be something that we could do. Um, yeah, Morcar it was. Um, there. Duke Morcar looks after the Duchy of Northumbria, which is all of those things that have lit up in pink there. So, um, so yeah, Duke Morcar did come down and set fire to our lands not that long ago. So maybe at some point we can go and exact revenge upon him because that's just uncalled for. That's just mean. So here we go. Let's dive in, shall we? Let's create ourselves an exciting, fantastic new dynasty as Earl Waltheof Sewardson of Northamptonshire. So welcome to the 15th of September 1066 AD and welcome to England. Now this is what England looks like right now. That might well change in the coming months because there's quite a lot of fighting about to happen because 1066 is the year that England gets invaded by people who want to take control of it. So currently King Harold is in charge. Now the previous king died, left nowhere. So King Harold stepped in and said, hey, don't you worry, I'll be the king. It's all fine. And everyone kind of went, yeah, okay, fine. You crack on, do king things, wear a crown. You've got a nice moustache, carry on. But then some people have said, actually, no, I believe I have a claim to the English throne. So I'm going to come over here and I'm going to exact that claim and try and take the throne from you, Harold. So we can see up here 
there are some people. They're not supposed to be there. These are Norwegian invaders. So Harald Hardrada from Norway, which is all the way up there, he believes that he should have control of the English throne. So he has come down here to go to war with Harald. So there's Harald and Harald. So Harald has come to go to war with Harald to try and take the English throne. Which is, yeah, that's okay. But there's some Vikings, it's fine. They're going to have to fight them. But then we know that at some point from over here, from Normandy, wherever about that might be, some boats are going to come over and land on the south coast because also Duke William of Normandy also feels like he should be in control of the English throne. So poor Harold, with his lovely crown, is going to have to try and keep his lovely crown from both invaders to the north in the form of Norwegians, and from the south in terms of the French from Normandy. And that's going to be quite tricky. And here we are, just in the middle. We're going to be right in the middle between those two kind of battle areas. And I don't know what's going to happen. Are we going to get dragged in? Are we going to have to fight? Are we going to be able to avoid it because we're far away from here and here? I don't know. I really don't know what's going to happen, but it's going to be very, very intriguing to find out. So, uh, so yeah, there we go. That's where we are. So, the slap bang in the middle. War here, war here. We will see what happens. So, there we go. We know war is going to happen. We know it's going to actually kick off. I mean, the Norwegians are actually there already. They have kind of, you know, got onto our soil, if you like. They've got onto English soil. So, you know, I think we'll see, um, we'll see Harold sending some troops up at some point relatively soon. Um, Okay, let's take a look at our character. So this is us down here. So Earl Waltheof Stewartson of Northamptonshire, you are only 16 years old. You have no spouse. Okay, so we need to sort that out. We need to get you married at some point. Uh, let's take a look at your skills then. So every character has a set of skills and these are our skills for our main character right now. So we have ourselves a diplomacy of 10, which is average. That's okay. We've got a marshal of seven. So marshal is how good you are at sort of, you know, uh, fighting and sort of wars and stuff like that. A marshal of seven. That is poor. That's unfortunate. A stewardship of eight. That is also poor. That is how well you run your kingdom and how many taxes you can have and all that kind of stuff. So that's also unfortunate. That's poor. Uh, intrigue is five, which is poor. So he, he, we're not we're not looking too good at the minute. So yeah, that's quite poor as well. So that's to do with like spying and uh, you know sort of assassinations and plots and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then we've got ourselves learning eleven, which is average. Okay, I mean, we've not got the best stats. We are not the best character in the game, I'm fairly sure. And then we've got traits as well. So we have the education trait, so we were educated, of adequate bargainer. Oh, good. So we're adequate at bargaining. <laughs> not great, not brilliant, just adequate. We're okay, we can bargain. Okay, fine. So we've got adequate bargainer, which gave us plus four to our diplomacy. Right, okay, that's quite a sort of a, a lift up there. So we've got plus four from adequate bargainer, and plus two from forgiving. Ah, so we have forgiving as well. There we go. So yeah, so we're forgiving, quick to move on from most things. So we got some diplomacy, we lost some intrigue, we've got a bit of learning, and prisoners have a higher opinion of us. Okie doke. And then we're wrathful, so we're quick to anger. Okay, so that lost us diplomacy but gave us some martial, and it gives us 20 natural dread. I think dread is how scary we are to the other characters. I think, you know, if we are, if we've got quite a lot of dread, the other characters are a little bit fearful to do anything against us because they think that we're just going to go and sort of, you know, go and get them. <laughs> so, okay, so we're a little bit sort of fearful and, um, oh, and we're deceitful as well. So we're deceitful, wrathful, forgiving and an adequate bargainer. Wow, you are, you are certainly, you are certainly varied in your kind of things. So deceitful reduces our diplomacy, but gives us some intrigue and we don't like honest people. <laughs> okay. We don't like honest people, and um, and we are sinful to Catholics. So the Catholic opinion of us is a little bit low, and we get less uh, sort of uh, piety as well. Okay, so there's our stats. So every character has those stats, um, and uh, yeah, we do not have the best. We don't have the finest stats in the land. Okay, uh, we're Catholic, we are an Anglo-Saxon culture, that's fine. And we have ourselves two titles. Okay, so this is how the game sort of functions with the land you own. So we've got the Earldom of Huntingdonshire, which is just there. Ah, okay, so that's that bit over there at the end. And then we've got the Earldom of Northamptonshire. So we own those two, so that's why we've got control of that land. And then we've got two claims. A claim to the Earldom of Benicia. Where's Benicia? Can we zoom out? Is it in, in England somewhere? Uh, yeah, it's there. I think that's it. Yeah, Benicia, what's that? Okay, so we have a claim on that place. That's interesting. I wonder why. And then we've got a claim on the whole Duchy of Northumbria. So we feel like we should own those three places there. Benicia, Dunholm and Cumberland. Good sausages. Um, that We feel like we should own all three of those. We have a claim on those. Oh, that's interesting. Also, yeah, that's interesting. Those two are held by, um, what's that, Northumbria. 
and that is held by the Kingdom of Scotland. Oh, okay, that, that could be difficult to get all three of those. That could be quite tricky. Okay, right, and then in terms of family, uh, both parents seem to have died and grandparents are dead. We've got no children. We've not got a wife or anything because we can see up here there's no spouse. And we have two siblings. Okay, so we have ourselves someone in Scotland, King Malcolm III. Actually the king? Our half-brother is the King of Scotland. Okay, I feel like that could be something that we could work to our advantage if only I knew how. Oh my goodness me! <laughs> He is the actual king of Scotland, our half-brother. Wow, so he's 35, so he's a bit older than us, but he is the, the actual king of Scotland. Okay, that's wonderful. Uh, yeah, he's got loads of titles. He's got loads of titles. And um, again, then we've got another half-brother, Donald the Fair Dunkeld, who is uh, half-brother, chancellor and knight, a godless empath. Wow, okay. Um, and you are in Northamptonshire. Okay, so yeah, there we go. So we need to get married and we need to have some kids because um, a little bit like um, a little bit like the guild, a little bit like the guild three, your game continues through a dynasty of uh, children. You don't sort of control Northamptonshire itself. You control the family that look after Northamptonshire. So um, yeah, if the family dies, if we uh, lose, let's say if he got ill tomorrow and died of the pox, that'll be it. It will be game over. So we need to make sure that we get married and then have some children so our game can continue, which will be splendid. Um, okay. Oh, this is interesting. Okay, right. So that's interesting. We've got our brother is the King of Scotland. Well, our half-brother, which is quite handy. And um, so up here, we've got some sort of kingdom stats. So we get ourselves a bit of income, uh, 2.7 gold, and we've got 33 gold in the bank. Uh, we get ourselves some prestige. We get quite a bit of that, do we? 0.88 per month. And we've got 450 prestige sort of stored. So that's quite good. Uh, we have 100 piety. We get a little bit of that. And we have some renown as well. And we can muster up 500 and 46 soldiers so 541 people from levies which is just us going around to all of the people that we look after and saying hello can you give me some people to go and have a fight please and they go yeah sure here's 30 people or whatever so we can muster 541 people and five knights and they have a high quality so yeah quality is in troops so you could have troops that just turn up like, like, I don't know, peasants, like a rabble of peasants with pitchforks. They're going to be poor quality. Whereas we've probably got people with, you know, armor and weapons and that kind of stuff and a vague bit of tactics. So they're high quality. Okay, that's interesting. Right, so there we go. So we've looked at all those. I think job number one should be possibly just taking a look around our kingdom. A little kind of area just here and seeing what we've got. It's not our kingdom, it's our earldom. So let's have a look. So we've got Northampton just here. So what's Northampton got going on for it? We look after it. It generates a bit of tax, some people, and it's got in it a wooden barracks and a bastion and curtain walls. Ah, so it's kind of got a castle-y thing in there. That's quite good. That's quite helpful. And then we've got ourselves there, the Bishopric of Kettering, that has some monastic schools that give us some tax. That's quite nice. And some, some piety as well. Then we've got ourselves, what's that? That's Peterborough. So the city of Peterborough has some guild halls, gives us some money. That is, Norman Cross, is he? Maybe he should calm down. That's got nothing in it at all. Uh, and then we've got Hurstingstone, which has got hunters' lodges and wooden barracks. And then we've got the Bishopric of Leytonstone, which has got prayer halls in it. Okay, and in each of these we can build some stuff. So we can construct new buildings in those particular areas. They are quite expensive, I believe. I think if we tried to build something now, we would be absolutely well short. Yeah, 33 gold is what we've got. To build a forestry, we need 100 gold, and it takes three years. So yeah, time passes. A lot of time will pass in Crusader Kings 3. An awful lot of time will pass. Um, okay, right. Now, one thing we are going to do before we start anything else. Uh, this is our house that we belong to. Now, we currently belong to House Northumbria as part of the Northumbria dynasty. I don't think that's going to do. That's just not right. So yeah, House Northumbria with the sort of the motto of safety without wrath. No, 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 no. I d this isn't going to do at all. Let's change this to something far more appropriate. There we go. That is way more appropriate. So we are now House Cupboard with the motto of hello, lovely people. And we are part of the Cupboard Dynasty. That feels better. Not Northumbria, whatever it was. No, no, no. Cupboard Dynasty. House Cupboard. Hello, lovely people. It's all looking nice. So yeah, as we become more famous, as House Cupboard and the Cupboard Dynasty become more known across the land, we will pick up Renown, and then we can use Renown to open these sort of dynasty legacies. But of course, nobody knows who we are right now. 
The Cupboard Dynasty has not unlocked any legacies, I guess because we don't have enough going on for us. In fact, yeah, there's only two members and one of them is living. So I'm the only living member currently of the Cupboard Dynasty and House Cupboard. So yeah, I think we need to get a few more people, make ourselves a little bit more renowned before we can actually start getting these legacy things. But there we go. House Cupboard and Cupboard Dynasty are now in existence and soon people will know us and people will come to us for lovely, lovely cups of tea. Okay, so another thing we can actually get done, we can pick a lifestyle for ourselves as well. So we have all these different lifestyles and these essentially give us perks. So we choose a lifestyle, we earn XP, and when we've got enough XP, we can pick a perk. So we can choose diplomacy. Now, because we have a diplomatic education, which is uh, which is that thing, hang on, go back in there. Because this is an education trait, which was a diplomacy based one, uh, we can get a bonus in the Diplomacy lifestyle. We get 20% more experience. It would make sense to take advantage of that. That would be quite good. So let's go into there and see what we can do. So these are all the perks. We can't get those now because now we need to pick a focus. So we've gone to Diplomacy lifestyle and now we need to pick a focus. So the Foreign Affairs focus just gives us a straight plus three Diplomacy. So that will put us up to 13 Diplomacy. That could be quite useful. Majesty focus. That sounds very wonderful. And um, that gives us plus one diplomacy, so up to 11, but does give us one prestige per month. That could be very handy indeed. How much prestige did we get? Not a lot. And then family focus gives us plus two diplomacy and then increases our fertility by 20%. Now, obviously that's useful for having children. However, our character here, our character is only 16 years old. I think he should be okay. If we find him uh, a young wife who um, is also you know, similar in age to him, then he sh they should be all right. They should not have any problems in conceiving a child. So I think, how much, um, how much prestige do we get? How much is that? 0 0.8 per month. We could improve that. We could make that much better. So we can get an extra point of diplomacy and then also get some more prestige. Let's do that. Let's go down there. We'll select that. So yes, please. Prestige and diplomacy. Yes. And now we'll start earning experience and then we can start going down these trees. And you don't just choose one and then work your way through it. You can have one there and you can spend three points here and five points there or whatever. So you can just work through these particular perks and stuff. But there you go. We are focused on becoming slightly more majestic. I mean, you do have quite majestic hair anyway. You're quite majestic hair. So, um, so yeah, okay, there we go, right. That's that done. I think now, I mean, there's all these different bits up here that are sort of helping us. There's no air yet, we know about that. Um, nominated successor, we'll do that shortly. We need to get married first. Uh, you're not married, you have no spouse. Let's go and sort that out as well. So let us go to here, we'll click on us and we'll go to find a spouse. Now this brings up a list of all the available people that might be our spouse and there are 1,189 possible matches. <laughs> that's how many characters there are in the game. And that's kind of you know, only the ones that are eligible to marry us. There's so many other characters. So um, I think we might need to filter that down a teeny tiny little bit. So we can filter that by this just here. So what we can do is people like uh, the you know, other people with the same traits. They kind of get on. So, you know, if they're both forgiving, they will get on a bit better and they might well start passing traits down and all that kind of stuff. They might pass traits down to their children. So let's see if we can find anybody with the personality. No, not personality. What was it? Forgiving, not personality. Forgiving. Forgiving trait. So anybody with the forgiving trait, and we probably also do want them to be a Catholic as well. I don't want them to be sort of, you know, not the same religion as us because that might make things a bit awkward. Okay, so now there's only 102. Well, that's good. That's whittled it down loads. Um, okay, so we want to look for somebody who's got another little sort of bonus thing here as well. In fact, oh, hang on. What's that? You're scaly. What? You're covered in scaly patches of skin, but you're also fruitful and fertile. Okay, um, we can order it here because when they have children, sometimes the skills can get passed down to the children. And also we can then say that our spouse can kind of educate children and then they pass on their skills and traits to them there. So maybe we have somebody that's really good at stewardship, someone that's really good at running the place. Oh my goodness me, you've got 18. Wow. Okay, that's very good. You're gregarious, forgiving and callous. Okay, maybe not you, ah, but you do like us quite a lot. So yes, every single person has an opinion of everybody else, which is quite staggering. It makes you wonder how the game doesn't grind to a halt. So uh, yeah, Adeline's opinion of us is that, um, yeah, she's forgiving. Uh, oh no, we're both forgiving, so that goes up a bit, but I'm deceitful. She doesn't like that. And then personal diplomacy is plus six. 
So we have a total of plus 16. So she thinks favourably of us. I imagine there are people that do not think favourably of us somewhere down the line. Um, okay, I mean, you're... You're callous. Do I want... Do I want somebody that's callous? I don't think so. You're forgiving, humble and diligent. That sounds quite good. But you have a trait here that's congenital, so that might get passed down. So that's quick. So you get plus one to skills and... You get plus 10% to your lifestyle experience. That's quite good. You are stubborn, paranoid, and forgiving. Okay. <laughs> You've ruined it with those there. You've ruined it with your stubborns and your paranoids. Um, nobody else has got those kind of trait things. You're hale. You're fit and sound of body. Okay, so you're quite healthy. Um, but yeah, we're coming down in stewardship skill. I'd like someone who's really good at stewardship. Because then they can help out. We have a council. So we can put them on the council. They can help out. How about we get urn guard? You're Swabian. I can't tell where Swabian is, but you're Swabian. And yeah, you're forgiving, humble, and diligent, which is brilliant. So yeah, you sound very good and your health is fine. Let, let's go for you. Let's go for Ermgard. So yeah, please, let's marry you. We'll accept plus seven. Okay. And you can make it matrilineal if you want the kids to be born into sort of her side of the dynasty. You can do, but don't think that's what we want to do. We want the children for us because we need an heir. So we'll send the proposal... So it, they should accept. They should accept. So we'll do that. And of course, yes, we need an heir. So the year is 1066. It is the way of things that, uh, yep, the boys take priority over the girls. It's just that's what happened in 1066. And that's what's happening in this game. So, um, so yeah, we want to have a boy, ideally. Um, so we can, you know, carry on the line and stuff. I think you can carry on. If you have all girls or one girl or whatever, you can pass on the dynasty to a girl. But then it becomes more tricky when she grows up and then, um, and then marries I think it becomes a little bit trickier then because you people want to marry the girl into their dynasty, into the male side of the dynasty, and then also you lose control of them and it becomes a little bit of a sort of a bit of a faff with that. So yeah, we want to make sure that we have boys because it makes life a whole lot easier because 1066. Okay, so we've done all those things. We've renamed that. Um, we are Catholic and I believe most of the place around us is Catholic. Yeah, there's an awful lot of Catholicism going on. Hooray. And um, come out of that. And um, yeah, we're Anglo-Saxon. And we kind of do have a little bit of research here. So our culture head is Harold, and he is fascinated with armillary spheres. Aren't we all, Harold? Um, okay. Yeah, what does that do? Naval speed up 25%. So we'll research that. We'll discover that in 38 years' time, and then we can move our boats quicker. Uh, yeah, landlocked Northamptonshire. Not too enamoured with that kind of thing you're looking at there, but never mind. Okay, next thing to do, and I realise there are quite a lot of things to do before we even move time on. Because, yeah, time has been paused. No time has passed since we've been doing all of these things. But there are quite a few things that we need to sort of get sorted out. And we do have a council. We have a council. So let's have a look at our council and just see what's going on. So we have a bishop. Hello, Keelwolf. Seelwolf, possibly. Um, you're quite good. So you have a learning of 15. That is good news. We like that. You're a good bishop. However, you don't like us. Your opinion of us is a little bit rubbish, which means that you do not endorse us, which means we don't get taxes from his church and we don't get any levied troops from his churches either, because that's how kind of churches worked, I suppose. So we want him to like us a bit, but OK, right, we'll work on that. And they've got a chancellor with a skill of 13 diplomacy. That's pretty good. Um, Donald, oh, yeah, you're our, you're our brother. Yeah, you're our brother. OK, there you go, Donald. Hello, you're our half-brother. How are you? You can be the chancellor. Then we've got a steward. We've got Steward Biotma. Uh, you're not very good. You've only got stewardship of eight, and you don't really like us very much either. We can replace you. I wonder if it's worth replacing you. Now, you there, the marshal there, Reeve Seewald, you're brilliant. 18. That is absolutely fantastic. So you're really good. So we'll keep you. And then we have the spy master Reeve Ulfsitel, who's only got an intrigue of eight, which is poor. Now, that is unfortunate. Now, the only thing is, characters with this little kind of, uh, this little sort of fist thing here, they are powerful vassals, and they demand a seat on the council. Now, if we kick them off, that means that they get quite grumpy, and then they start not liking us, and they might plot against us, and all that kind of stuff. So, right now, even though he's rubbish, even though he's only got a, an intrigue of eight, which is poor, we might need to leave him in place. We might need to leave him there. Right, have we got anyone better at stewarding, other than eight? So, we can swap you out, we can order it by that, we really do not. So these are all the people in our court. The guests and knights and all sorts of other stuff. Uh, yeah, that's we really don't. 
We really do not. That is very, very disappointing. Okay, never mind. So yeah, the higher their um their stewardship, the more taxes they collect. But yeah, because he's not got too much in the way of skill, we're not getting that much of a bonus to our taxes. Okay, and then our spouse has not arrived yet. If they even accept, I do not know. Uh, okay, right, let's try and get Chappie here. Let's try and get Seal Wolf to actually like us a bit. So he would then give us some uh, taxes from the church and also give us some levies from the church as well if we need to go and have a bit of a fight. So what we can do is we can right click on you and then we can sway you. We can do a personal scheme where we go and sway him. Now I don't know exactly how we do this. Uh, do we just send him nice poems, presents? I'm not entirely sure. Go and whisper rumours in his ear or something. I'm not sure. But uh, yeah, we do this and eventually at some point we might see an increase of 25 opinion, which means that if it were first time, that would be splendid. That would be great. Okay, so let's do that then. So we'll start a sway scheme. And there's other schemes as well. You can do other schemes. This is a personal scheme. You can do slightly sinister schemes like murders and kidnappings and all that kind of stuff. Let's just start off with uh, you know, just telling somebody that they should like us a bit. Let's not kind of murder him right now. So yeah, okay, we'll start that. Start a sway scheme against Seal Wolf. So I think we should move time on a little bit. Let's move time on. We don't really need to do too much right now. We can just watch what's going on with the war. So up here, we will see Norway start presumably going and sort of doing some pillaging and what have you. So there we go. Right. So time is moving. It's now the 16th, 17th. So we have started our adventure in Crusader Kings 3. Okay, so time has moved on the tiniest amount and our marriage proposal has been accepted. So there we go. Hurrah. Greetings, Earl Walthy of Northamptonshire. I accept your marriage proposal. You'll be joined with my acquaintance, Ermgard, in holy matrimony. Thank you, Countess Adelheid of Zollern. Excellent. Okay, so now are you here? Yes, Countess Ermgard is here. Right, now she can help us out in a number of different ways in the council. So um, she can assist us, which just gives us a general boost to some of our things. We get one diplomacy, one marshal, three stewardship, because she's good at it, one intrigue and one learning. But we could put her onto managing our domain, which gives us seven stewardship. So she helps us out quite a bit, which should increase our monthly income quite a bit. So if we do that, currently on 2.8, up to three. Okay, not, not quite as a, a meteoric effect as I was hoping there, but still a bit more. Better than nothing. Better than a kick in the teeth. Okay, right. So now we've moved time on a little bit. Now we can see what's going on with the war. So the Norwegians are sort of uh, shuffling into position over here. Looks like they're going to go and attack. Where's that? They're going to go and attack if Forwick. Wherever that might be, I don't know. And then these little things pop up. These are kind of, you know, building the story. With my marriage to Countess Ermgard, the realm expects us to throw a suitably extravagant wedding celebration. It is well within my right to collect a royal aid duty as part of this, but some may consider it tasteless to levy an extra tax during a time of jubilation. Okay, so what do we do? Of course I will collect it who pays for their own wedding. Okay, so we get 75 gold just for, you know, because we tax people to pay for our wedding. Or... I'll let my subjects enjoy the festivities without worry or care. That gives us 350 prestige. We paid that, didn't we? Didn't we pay that out as part of the wedding agreement? So yeah, let's do that. Let's let the subjects enjoy the festivities because we get 1.9 prestige per month, but we get three income. So we're going to get more gold anyway. So let's do that. Let's get that back. 500 prestige. That is very useful. And we use that for like declaring wars and doing other bits and bobs as well. So it's probably quite useful that that's there. And here we go. The siege is underway. The siege of Iforwick is underway and the Kingdom of Norway have begun their assault. Now, are there any troops? Yes. So England have become aware that that is a thing that's happening and they're going, oh, cracky, we should go and stop them. Um, council invitation to my vassal. As an influential earl, it's only fair that you have a voice on my council. In recognition of this fact, I hereby offer you the position of Steward of Mercia. Okay, right, so this is going to require a little bit of explaining. And this is what I found the most difficult thing to kind of get my head around when I was doing the tutorial for this game. So um, it's how sort of things are managed and how kingdoms are broken up and how counties are managed and there's duchies and de jure things and all sorts of stuff. So, um, right, let's accept this. So this chappy here, he looks after Mercia. He is the Duke of Mercia. So he is the Duke of the Duchy of Mercia, which covers that area there which is lit up. So that is the Duchy of Mercia, and he looks after it. It's his, and he is the Duke of it. And we are part of it, if you look. We light up. So if we go over there, we are part of Mercia. And that's fine. If we look on this map here, the Duchy of Mercia should cover at least that area just there, which I believe it does if we do that. Yep, yeah. it covers that area and a little bit more as well. So that chappy controls all of Mercia. 
hint of being the Duke, and some other land as well, which is absolutely fine. So that's good. So he's looking after that. So he is now our boss. We report into him, and he reports to the king. So the idea is that you start off at the smallest level with... Let's accept that. So yes, we'll be the steward on your council. Thank you. So you start off with counties. Counties are small. This is a county just here. The county of Northamptonshire. That then rolls up into a duchy, which we can see just here. So the Duchy of Mercia. So if you own a county, you're a, you're whatever we are. What are we again? We are an earl. So if you are, own a county, you're an earl, like we are. Then if we were to if we were to somehow take control of Mercia, we could then become a duke, and we would have this duchy under our control. So we become the Duke of Mercia, which is exciting. Um, and then it rolls up to a kingdom. So the Kingdom of England. So you know that's all of the duchies underneath it combined becomes that. And then we have an Empire of Britannia. So yeah, it kind of scales up. So you start off small and then work up a step bigger and then a step bigger and then the biggest of all the steps. So the Empire of Britannia is not actually created because nobody owns all of that territory in one go. I mean, could we give that a go? It's a bit ambitious. <laughs> we could certainly try. However, right now we're a little bit small and there is a big war happening. So maybe we shouldn't get involved with those dreams just yet. We'll, we'll put them on ice. We'll put them on ice. So, um, so yeah, so now we're on somebody else's council. So the chap who runs Mercia, the Duke, um, he's now our liege, and he has a bishop, a chancellor, and we are the steward. So we get an extra bit of money for being his steward. We get paid some money. I guess we get paid like a wage for doing the job. Uh, and then we get uh, extra taxes, and building construction is a bit cheaper, and we get some lifestyle experience 10% quicker, which is splendid. So that's really good. And we've been put into that position. And I guess that's because our spouse is also helping us. Yeah, we get plus seven from, from her, <laughs> which is brilliant. So, uh, yeah, we've got 15. So I look really good in the council, but really none of it's me. None of it is me at all. <laughs> there we go. That's absolutely fine. So we can see other people as well. Countess Margaret's the spy master from over there. And uh, Earl Edric is from over there. Earl Wolfstan from down there. And the bishop. I don't think the bishop actually owns any sort of land, does he? Okay, there we go. So we're on someone else's council. Which is exciting. That, that's a good thing. Right, let's watch what's going on here with the um, with the fight. So we can see these are English troops. And they're going to move up here and go, Oi, Norway, what are you doing? Clear off. Go away, would you please? Also, we might want to look at possibly taking some extra land. We've got 608 troops. So 603 levies that we could... Yeah, we can summon 603 fighting people plus five knights... Do we want to start looking at taking some land from somewhere else? Like here, Warwick. They could only muster... Hang on, let's click on you. Earl Edgar, you can only muster 286 people over in Warwickshire. We could get ourselves a claim on Warwickshire and then go in and say, hang on a minute, Warwickshire is rightfully mine. Go to war, take it, and then Warwickshire would be ours. And we get all the things that are in Warwickshire. That's what we could do. That could be our first step. Now, I think everywhere else... Hang on, go back to that. Um, yeah, we've got East... East Sixy. <laughs> I don't know how you say that. East Six? I don't know. Um, East Anglia could be quite good. I mean, who runs that? Duke Griff? Okay. I mean, if we declare war on you, I believe... Yeah, that's kind of effectively declaring war on Harold. I'd rather, uh, not Harold. King Harold, sorry. That's a bad idea. But could we have a go at you, Warwickshire? Because there's an earldom of Warwickshire just sort of there on your own. I wonder if that's possible. Hang on, if we go to you. Earl Edgar. Hello. Ah, we can't declare war on you. What we can do is, though, we can go and fabricate a claim. So we don't have a claim on Warwickshire right now. There is no reason why Warwickshire should be ours. We just want it because we do. <laughs> so we need to fabricate something. So what we do is... We get our Bish. Where is he? There you go, Bish. We get you, even though you hate us. And we're going to move you to fabricate a claim on Warwickshire. So you go through and you, I don't know what you do, you go to libraries and you look through documents and you eventually find some really tenuous reason why we should be in charge of Warwickshire and then we've got a reason to go and fight you. So we'll do that. So we'll fabricate a claim upon Warwickshire, please. There we go. Right, Warwickshire will soon be ours. And he potters off over there and he does what he's got to do. And um, yeah, progress is quite slow. I think as well, it doesn't help that he doesn't really like us very much. The Earl of Huntingdonshire gained military presence for five years. That's quite good. Garrison size of plus 20% and he controls the region better. That's very good. Oh, and that's especially good because he is our marshal. He is over here on our council. That's that guy. 
So now he, as well as being really, really good, also has that particular extra skill thing, wherever it was. Oh, that's very good. Oh, okay, well done. Yeah, that's really handy. So he's become even better. He's become even better at doing stuff. He's become even better at doing military stuff. That's very helpful. Okay, splendid. So yeah, we can see that he is, is looking after that area for us. If we go to our realm, we can see that he's looking after Norman Cross. So he's actually just sitting in there looking after it. So we're not looking after that directly. And then over here in uh, in Peterborough, Reeve Ulfsetel is looking after Peterborough as well. So those two areas, we're not really looking after. Somebody else is dealing with those for us, which is quite good because we do have a limit. We have a limit of how many things we can look after ourselves. And if we go over that limit, then everything starts falling apart and we can't control it all. It's like spinning too many plates and we drop them all and smash on the floor. So yeah, we need to sort of hand things off to our vassals and such like for them to look after for us. Um, let's see what we can do then. So that's now going up. So we're getting a claim on Warwickshire, slowly but surely. What is happening up here? So the English have fought away that first force of Norwegians but now it looks like some more Norwegians are coming in oh there's loads of Norwegians there are lots and lots of Norwegians now the English have got the better quality troops but the Norwegians have got the numbers um our knight Duke Morcar was maimed by an enemy soldier Duke Morcar was the one we don't like isn't it isn't he the Northumbria one yes you are a bit of a pain okay that's fine uh, however if we look on the south coast, <laughs> we will see here that, uh, that some other invaders, the Duchy of Normandy, have come in. So there we go. William has come in. Duke William the Bastard. And that's his, yeah, that's his title at this point in time. That's not being rude. Um, he has come in and he's invading the south. So now poor Harold, with his wonderful crown and his lovely moustache, is kind of fighting up here and down there. And they're quite far apart. They're quite a distance away. So he's got to sort of split his troops between here and there to see what's happening. And of course, reinforcements are coming in. Uh, that is, who is that there? They're the petty kingdom of Brittany. So I wonder if they've got some allies going on. So let's have a look. The Norman conquest. Yes, they have an ally. So they've got, yeah, 1,237 soldiers from the, uh, the petty kingdom of Brittany. So that's not helping, is it? They've got reinforcements. Have the um, have the Norwegians got reinforcements? Yes, they have. They've got these two. So they've got uh, Eric, the second Sten Kilsen of Sweden, and Petty King Gudrod Haraldsson of the Isles as well. Oh my goodness me! <laughs> so they've got quite a lot of allies. And poor King Harold of England is just on his own. He's just on his own going, oh, <laughs> help, <laughs> somebody help. Your acquaintance Earl Edric created the Liberty Faction against Duke Morcar. Oh! Oh, hang on, you've just gone grey. Are you dead? Are you dead? No, you've just sort of greyed out. I thought you might... Oh, you are dead. We're slain in battle. <gasps> Duke Morcar is dead. Oh. Oh, my goodness me. Does that open up a power vacuum? So that guy there, that guy there, what did you do? You created a liberty faction against Duke Morcar. But I don't think that matters anymore because Duke Morcar is quite dead. He has been killed in a battle up there, I assume. Oh. Oh, that's very intriguing. Um, oh, hang on, what? What is this? What's the Duchy of Brynek? When when did this appear? What, hang on, what? What Duchy is this? Oh, it's all gone strange. Stuff is happening. Uh, yeah, stuff changing right now. So Mercer is still there. Where's, where's Northumbria gone? The Duchy of Northumbria has vanished. It's, it's not there anymore. We think we should have that. We think that's our one, isn't it? That's our land up there. Hang on a minute, hang on a minute. Hang on. Where, where's that? Where's that? Yeah, we think we should have that. The Duchy of Brynek should be ours. We believe that that belongs to us. But uh, where's where's Northumbria gone? Where Where's it vanished to? It's gone. Because I guess the guy who controlled it is died. He's dead. So now nobody has taken over it, possibly. And it's just collapsed into all these different sort of independent bits. So yeah, up there, look. They're just looking after themselves now and them. They are... I don't know why, what they belong to. They belong to up there. Oh, my goodness me. So already it's changed. Already it's changed. Not even a year has gone by. About, what, six months-ish has passed, maybe? And, um, and yeah, it's already, already changed the landscape. So, yeah, we're now sort of bordering this place here. Okay, that's that's interesting. <laughs> right you are. Um, I mean, are we still all right to go and try and get Warwickshire at some point? Uh, have you changed? You are now... Um, Duke Maradud. Oh, no, hang on. Now you're looking after... Your liege is the guy who looks after all of that. Hang on, what? That's just... Did that just grow again? I'm, I'm now... Hang on a minute. Now I, now I am baffled. <laughs> what's, what's going on there? 
Hang on a minute. Um, Catholicism has further decreased by 10 due to a sinful prince. Ah, oh, right, yeah, okay. So religion is a thing. We've not really seen too much of it yet. But, um, yeah, Catholicism's further has decreased because <laughs> there's been a prince archbishop who's been exposed. I dread to think what that means. Okie dokie. <laughs> right you are. Stop exposing yourself. Um, yeah, this is, this is before. Yeah, look, there, look. Are we now part of Brainiac? Oh, I think we are. We form part of Brainiac. Oh, right. Well, there we go. We're part of a new thing. Who is our liege? And then he reports into Harold Godwinson, who's the actual Harold who's doing the fighting. Oh, there we go. Well, there you go. Crusader Kings, everybody. It's changing all the time. Things are switching about on the south coast. What is happening? Uh, where is he? William is doing some fighting. He is he's just plundering mercilessly down here. He's just got free reign. There are no English troops coming down because they're all engaged up here. Um, all right, here we go. So our old court position vanished because our liege sort of vanished. He died. He got killed a bit. So uh, right, the new one is saying, do you want to come in? So it's an influential It's in your fair that you have a voice. Steward. Okie dokie. So now I am the steward on the new liege's council. Okie dokie. So I get my bonus back and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Yeah, I'm a bit concerned that the, the the Normans are just just wandering about the south with relative freedom, just going, yep, we'll have all this, thank you very much. And meanwhile, up here, where are the English troops? Is that it? Oh no, there's some there. There's some there. 1,000 or so of them. And I think the rest are in a, they're in a bad way. I think they're in a bad way. Social manipulation. The first time it happened, I barely even gave it a moment's thought. But my Marshal Reeves Seavold has grown bolder. His challenges no longer pass unnoticed at the council table. He is testing my limits. The others are sure to follow unless I give him a taste of his own medicine. Okay. So, mocking his insistent whining will shut him up. Uh, you guess see what is self-conscious and cares about what others think. Oh, we need to look at what he's like. He's shy. Ah, yes. And sadistic. And ambitious. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> sadistically ambitiously shy okie dokie so mocking his whining will shut him up he might not like that because he is shy so that might make him be quiet forgetting to invite him he's weak-minded or keeps to himself he is shy so that would work commenting on his graceful feet will throw him off graceful feet does he have nice feet why can you see his feet what kind of court are we running here <laughs> what's going on there um let's let's forget to invite him because if he's weak-minded or keep to himself and you're shy, then that's a good thing, isn't it? And that does give us, it gives us 50, 50 diplomatic lifestyle experience, which is nice. It does give us 10 stress. So we're doing something against one of our, uh, one of our traits, uh, which means that we do have a little stress meter in the corner. So, okay, we'll forget to invite him on purpose. Okay, so we'll do that. So yeah, we have a stress meter just here. Um, I don't know what happens when it goes to the top. I'm not entirely sure. I assume we get a terrible negative thing and something bad happens. But okay, we'll find out, I imagine. Um, and we have gained a manipulation hook on him. Okay, right. So since I began to withhold information from Reeves, Evold, he has made a damn fool of himself on more occasions than I can count. Dismissing his hopelessly outdated suggestions has been easier than outwitting a dog. Now he remains quiet, eyes cast low. Okay, right. So what we've done is we've got a hook. So a hook is kind of like a... I think that we can use as a, like a bargaining chip, I suppose. So now we know something about him. We know that this has happened. And if we wanted to do something, we can throw our hook in. And that you know, sways his favour a little bit. That gives us a little bit more persuasion power, if you like. It's kind of like a favour, I suppose. But an unwilling kind of favour, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it's a bribe without money, I suppose. It's like a hook. We can sort of hook him in and sort of use that against him. Um, cruel, perhaps, but it had to be done. So his opinion of us goes up. Because we showed that we're no fool. And we've got that hook on him as well. So we can get him to do some stuff if we want to. Okay, interesting. Uh, right, what's going on with the fighting? South Coast, still nothing happening. The French are just running amok. And up here, it does look like the English are certainly on the back foot. Ah, Seal Wolf is not swayed. So our attempt to sway our bishop guy did not work. So he still doesn't like us. So we're still not able to get any money or any troops from him. Which is unfortunate. And there is fighting happening. The Battle of Carlisle is looking pretty bad, actually, for the Norwegians. The Norwegians are reduced to no fighting people. Now, when that does happen, 
when it goes down to zero, it doesn't mean that they've slaughtered all those people. It means that there's nobody left to fight, but they, you know, take their wounded and they're injured and they go and sort of uh, wander off, kind of, you know, slopey shouldered, and then they're able to sort of regroup a bit and then come back and fight again. They do suffer some losses. There are actual casualties, of course, but yeah, it's not like if you beat an army of 4,000, you've killed 4,000 people. You might have killed 2,000 and the remaining 2,000 can wander off and kind of get better and stuff. Um, yeah, now that's quite a lot of English forces there. That's, what have they got? 5,000 or something in a big pile there. If they get in as well, that would be handy. If you can go and support them, that would be great. But no, you're just happy to let your buddies die over there. Okay, <laughs> right you are. So yeah, the Norwegians are looking like they're being beaten back quite nicely up here by all the English forces. But down the south, the, it's it's all going a bit wrong there. It's it's not looking good. It's not looking good for, the, uh, for us in terms of against the Normans. So we're doing pretty good against the Norwegians. But the Normans are indeed... Just, just taking what they like. Completely unopposed. You might want to go and deal with that, Harold. You might want to go and deal with that. The Norwegians are looking pretty beat. Um, yeah, it, it, it's it's the, the Normans you might want to go and have a little poke at with a pointy stick or something. Okay, so there is a big fight going on down here between William of Normandy and Harold. However, Harold has been soundly, soundly beaten just there. That did not go well at all. That was an absolute resounding battering because, uh, because yeah, all sorts of uh, reinforcements came in. Uh, greetings, Earl Waltheoff of Northamptonshire. I have prowled through documents, uh, both ancient and of less certain provenance. I finally have enough material to make the case that you are the rightful lord of the Earldom of Warwickshire. All that's missing is one little bribe, of course. Um, okay, so we pay 75 monies, which we do have just, and... Um, and yeah, we might then be able to become the Earl of Warwick if we then go and militarily take them, if we can. Um, yeah, okay, we might as well do it, because otherwise I think it gets, you know, nothing happens from that, and that's a waste of time. Um, so now if we go to here, let's pause time for a second. Go to here, go to you. So you're not going to like us anymore, because you're there going, hang on a minute, you fabricated a claim against us. Um, if we then go declare war, yes, we're declaring a war directly against Earl Edgar of Warwickshire. Our claim... We've got 608 troops. He's got 582. Also an ally, however. Ah, botherations. He's got an ally up there. It would cost us 100 prestige. That's fine. We don't need to worry about that. We've got plenty of that. But it's, yeah, he's got a similar amount of troops. But also he's got an ally that could come in. Ah, oh, that's not good. That's not good at all. Okay, that's something we might have to ponder. Now, what we might have to do is, in here... In military, you can create men-at-arms regiments. So uh, the knights are sort of just sort of kicking about, waiting for a fight. The levies are where we go to our people. We go to all of our sort of folks around the place and say, hey, give us some people with pointy sticks to go and have a fight. And they go, okay, so we can muster 603. But then men-at-arms regiments are like a permanent sort of troop. They just sit there and wait, and we pay a bit of money on them when they're not in use, and we pay even more money on them when they are in use, and we can create all sorts of different types. We can create archers and pikemen and horsemen and what have you. Can't afford them right now. It might be worth saving up a bit of money, getting ourselves some, say, archers, and then firing upon our opponents from afar. That gives an extra boost. That might be enough to actually get this place under our control. We even, we, even with the help of their ally. That might be really, really useful. Okay, that's something we need to consider. We need to ponder that. That is something that we certainly need to look at. Do you know what? I think what we'll do is, with the country kind of in flux, with the, the French just sort of wandering about the south here, taking what they like, just William of Normandy just doing what he wants, it seems, um, we might be able to have a go at Warwickshire. And then the Norwegians up here looking a little bit kind of broken and beaten. I think what we'll do is we'll leave it for now. And we'll come back next time and just see what happens. And we'll carry on our little journey here with Northamptonshire. Still just Northamptonshire at the moment. But, you know, we can try and get some more territory as we go. And that gives us more gold and more everything else. And then we can easier get more troops. And then go and get some more people and so on and so forth. So, um, yeah, we'll come back and we'll see how we get on. But, yeah, this is very, very good. It's taken quite a long while to get used to. Because there are, as you've seen, quite a lot of things going on. There's an awful lot of buttons and options and numbers and things to understand. So, yeah, it's taken quite a little while to sort of understand things and you know how things all piece together but um yeah i think i've got a fairly good picture of it if i have misunderstood something please let me know in the comments i imagine i've done something completely wrong or explained something pathetically wrong so um so yeah if you're an experienced crusader kings player please do let me know what i'm doing wrong and all that kind of stuff um but yeah we'll finish up for now we'll come back and we'll see how we get on next time out hopefully you have enjoyed this if you have please do leave a like that would be most splendid indeed and also if you're not already then please do subscribe to keep up to date with how we get on here 
next time out in Crusader Kings 3. But for now, thank you very much for joining me in the Geek Cupboard, and I will see you next time. Kunik, your time is now, and you have missed Kunik. <laughs> this is this is unacceptable, Kunik. And Ash's caravan has been ambushed by manhunting chinchillas. <laughs> Are you going to land on my potatoes? <laughs> That is just not the done thing. Oh, there's a lot of them. One, two, three. These guys have got amazing hair. I'm delighted that we've actually done something and it's worked. Kunik, your time is now, and you have missed Kunik. <laughs> this is this is unacceptable, Kunik. And Ash's caravan has been ambushed by man-hunting chinchillas. <laughs> Are you going to land on my potatoes? <laughs> that is just not the done thing. Oh, there's a lot of them. One, two, three. These guys have got amazing hair. I'm delighted that we've actually done something, and it's worked.